Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ika Vat. Last week, US President Joe Biden hosted the leaders of Japan and the Philippines across back-to-back -back summits in a show of unity to Beijing. This from Ferdinand Marcos Jr. I think the trilateral agreement is uh, extremely important. It is uh, going to change the dynamic that we have been seeing uh, in the region, in ASEAN, in Asia, um, uh, around the South China Sea. What does deepening cooperation between Taiwan's neighbors and the U.S. mean for China? And what are the biggest agreements we should be watching? With us to discuss this are Chen Liangzi Evans, Institute for National Defense and Security Research Associate Research Fellow, and Chen Pingkui, National Zhengzhou University Department of Diplomacy Associate Professor, and Chen Fang Yu, Suzhou University Political Science Assistant Professor. A very warm welcome to all of you on the show today. Fang Yu, let me start with you. So this is some of the things that have been used to describe these summits, unprecedented engagement, massive modernization, historic updating of the Japan Security Partnership. Do you agree? And can you tell me briefly what you thought were some of the, or the biggest announcement to come out of last week? Well, I think everything is big in this summit. So there's a <laughs> significant upgrade of the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship, also a significant upgrade on the U.S. and the Filipino uh, relationship. So mm -hmm. I, I'm surprised to see a comprehensive uh, upgrade for uh, investment plan in the Philippines so, mm -hmm. so that we can see a show up of the, of the appearance of the U.S. in this region. Bing Hui, how about you? I was surprised by the depth and the details of U.S. commitment to Japan's defense especially around the Senkaku Diaoyu Island. I was also surprised by the magnitude of investment plans in the Philippines. This will be the biggest investment plan of IPEF. So this will be a flagship project, I would say. Mm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chen. During the uh, visit of Putin's uh, uh, trips to Beijing to meet uh, Xi, and he said, no limit of you know, Russian-Chinese relationship. So I think at this time, very, very similarly, you know, it seems that the U.S. and the Japan, they also promote, you know, their, you know, bilateral relationships toward unlimited, you know, non-limit. So I think that's a big, you know, thing to me. Mm. Big way, interesting that. So basically <clears throat> it's in response to China, Russia, mm -hmm. um, but also China's unprecedented military buildup. What are the threats or the challenges that China poses? So. Uh, for, for Japan and the Philippines. So both countries have the territorial disputes with China. So Japan and China, uh, Japan and China has a territorial, territorial dispute around the Senkaku Diaoyu Island in the East China Sea. Uh, North Korea is also a, a major security threat for, for threat for Japan. And uh, China supports the North Korean regime as we all know it. As for uh, China and the Philippines, they have major disputes around uh, in in the South China Sea, there are several disputed islands. The most, uh, the mo most recently, there are uh, more disputes and tensions around the Second Tanma Shoal when the Philippines try to resupply their personnel on the, on the Tan Second Tanma Shoal. Mm. Can we say that China is seeking to change the status quo, essentially? Uh, we can say that China tried to make a status quo, status quo that favors China's uh, view of the status quo. Mm. Fang Yi, so let's look, let's look at China's view. Mao Ning, who's the spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, she said, if these are not wanton smears and attacks on China, this is what came out of the summits, what are they? China's actions in the East China Sea and South China Sea are appropriate and lawful and beyond reproach. So therein, do we see what the problem is? China insists that it's right, so China will continue. Well, uh, we, we all know that China claims that all of the South China Sea belongs to the so-called uh, traditional territory of it. So uh, it tries to build up the military uh, uh, islands and also try to blockade others of, of approaching these islands. So I think the, the second Thomas show is, uh, is an example. Mm. So the ship has been there for a long time, mm. uh, since uh, 1999, so when the Philippines had grounded the, the ship there. Mm. However, uh, China just uh, escalated the, the tension since uh, recently, in, especially since 2022. Mm. So uh, let me give you a statistic there. So on, on average, uh, on 2021, uh, it's only about one ship per mission of China to uh, ship along, uh, alongside the second Thomas show. However, in 2023, 
uh, there's uh, about 14 vessels every time on average for, mm. from China. Bing Kui, if I can ask you, because we just heard from Fang Yi, mm. um, this, this news where uh, former Philippine President Rodrigo mm. Duterte has now confirmed that there was this so-called gentleman's mm. agreement between yeah. him and Xi Jinping, mm. where basically um, the Filipinos would not uh, repair the ship, the Sierra Madre, and also, therefore, the re resupply ships would not carry construction materials. Right. Um, Marcus has come out and said he wasn't aware of this agreement. He didn't agree to it. Mm. So what difference does any of this mean to what happens around Second Thomas Shoal? I, I think this means that tension in South China Sea will escalate be, because um, in, the, in the past for a very long time, the Philippines and China and other parties, all kinds of, they, they kind of postponed the dispute by not taking actions. They all have claims on each other's uh, features and, and islands, but, but they don't take actions against it, against it. This is the first time, as I remember, that the Philippines announced that they may uh, repair the ship on, and, or, or construct facilities on the Second Thomas Shoal. This will solidify their claims on the, on the Second Thomas Shoal as China did in other features in South China Sea. Mm. Fangi, um, what, what role does disinformation uh, play in this, you know, in terms of perhaps sowing doubt internally in the Philippines? I mean, initially, well, China maintains that the agreement actually was to remove the ship. This is something that Duterte has uh, denied. Well, actually, uh, there's, uh, I mean, each, each country has its own uh, claims on, on he here. So, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, diploma, uh, diplomatic uh, chaotic, chaotic uh, <laughs> missions here, but I think uh, each side must come to maybe to talk more on this, or because we have seen this uh, as a, a latest uh, conflict spotlight. Mm. Dr. Chen, um, both guests had touched on the economic investment, which was um, you know, a big deal for the Philippines. Uh, the Luzon Economic Corridor, um, you know, as we heard, is, is one of the IPEF um, signature projects, um, essentially to resist Beijing's Belt and Road inf infrastructure. But before we get into the economy, let's first talk about the security aspects. What do you think the message sent um, is sent sending to China um, if there will be, you know, new infrastructure, rail, road, between Clark and Subic Bay? Well, as we remember that, especially during the period of the Cold War, uh, the Subic Bay uh, is the biggest uh, naval base in East Asia. So definitely, uh, strategically uh, speaking, it's very, very important, not only for the Philippines, but mm. also for its allies, mm. the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, in the context of the China's threat uh, over the past years, so if you know the democracies are trying to build up uh, the naval base in Subibek Bay, that will be quite uh, a big step uh, for the allies to uh, counterbalance against China's threat. Mm. Uh, but but it wasn't chosen as one of the EDCA sites, was it? So it wasn't one of the five new sites announced. Uh, last year, but, but now there is, it is part of this new corridor. Uh, that's quite interesting. I mm -hmm. think, well, we, perhaps we had to see, you know, who, you know, indeed escalate the situation. So probably, you know, since, well, Beijing, well, from my perspective, Beijing, you know, take a very tough uh, position in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. in South uh, East Asia. So I think, that's quite reasonable for the United States and the Philippines to do that. Mm -hmm. And regarding the, uh, the uh, economic uh, measures, I think that's another way uh, for the United States to catch up its you know, strategic, uh, strategic advantage in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Because Beijing already you know, did lots of efforts in the area through its one bill, one law initiated over the past decade. Absolutely. Yeah. Bing Wei, you know, mm. is, is the economic investment is also part of resisting China in terms of its economic coercion? Yeah, well, I think it's a competition. Mm. Uh, we have seen that China used Belt and Road Initiative to invest in another, another many countries and many countries will come the investment from China. Um, and the U.S. has tried to counter it by announcing uh, in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. 
And for many years, the U.S. actually did not invest a lot of money in it. And this is the first time I think uh, the U.S. is really trying to make a deal. Mm. Fang Yu, a day before the trilateral, the, PA, uh, the Philippines ambassador to the U.S., said that he had been advised that around 10 billion U.S. dollars would flow into the Philippines over five to ten years. Is this as much as sort of resisting or uh, resisting China also about having full Filipino support behind the relationship, the growing relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines? Of course, I think uh, we, we all know that a strong alliance <coughs> does not consist only on the military side. So uh, it's not only about the military basis, or it's not on, only about the appearance of the military or, or the uh, military personnel, but also uh, I think the U.S. now ad adapting a strategy of engaging the whole the uh, Filipino uh, societies. Um, uh, so, so they want to do more to engagement on the social economic interactions with the Filipinos. And also it, it is in line with uh, the US strategy of invest, align, and compete. So this is how uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State, Blinken State, that they want to invest more and to align with uh, uh, their uh, allies and also in order to compete with China. So it's, it's a whole plan. It's not only about the military, but also mm. from e economy, the s s social influence, and all of the strategies. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Chen, um, just briefly going back to um, the military, uh, there was the announcement that Biden has asked for 128 million US dollars in the 2025 budget for the EDCA sites, there's 36 projects. What do you see as the significance of that? Well, the most significant thing uh, for the uh, budget or for the investment is to, uh, you know, to promote U.S. commitment to the regional security. Mm. So I think that's quite important. Does it also mean the Bing Wei? You um, want to add? So that? I would just want to add that uh, the aircraft sites uh, are uh, have already had the upgrade pr project since mm -hmm. 2016 uh, when they announced the ad card. 2014. So, uh, so, so the, the significant thing is that the, the amount of the budget significantly increased. It's doubled, yeah. more than doubled. Yeah, so, so over, over the past few years, the, the budget have never exceeded $100 million. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and is it also to, I mean, some of the projects will be, for, for example, at Basa Air Base, it's to uh, enable that, um, that air base to accommodate bigger, heavier uh, aircraft such yeah. as fighter jets, right? Mm, Transport right. planes. Okay, very final question for this part. Uh, Fang Yi, if I can ask you. So a Philippine mining company, Air Ramen Minerals, will be given a grant to develop ore to nickel and cobalt processing plant. So why is this significant? Well, it's very simple that because uh, it's part of the strategy of the U.S. to so-called de-risk from the China's market. So mm -hmm. it was decrease the in, uh, dependence on the Chinese market, especially on nickels and other mines. Yeah, which is used for batteries for electric cars? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, nickels uh, consists of half of the uh, export of the uh, Philippines uh, mining uh, industry. So it's uh, one of the most important uh, elements for uh, all over the world. So, so I think that is part of the plan to de-risk around China. Great, thank you. For more, I spoke to Patrick Cronin, head of Hudson Institute's Asia Pacific Security. I asked him what was the biggest thing Manila took away from the summits. Take a look. Overall, it's the support for Philippines to uh, have their claims um, registered uh, and supported and deeply affirmed. Uh, you had Tokyo and Washington saying that the 2016 tribunal ruling is legal and binding uh, and that the Mutual Defense Treaty of the United States applies uh, to the Philippines uh, throughout the South China Sea, including its civilian and military assets and people. Those are very strong words. They've been said before, but packaged together at a summit uh, and in this joint statement that the three leaders made at the White House, I think is a very strong statement that Beijing will definitely uh, be responding to in the coming coming weeks and months. The importance of the communications as well. Um, this, in not just in the Luzon Quarter, um, but uh, also in undersea cables, um, but the piloting of Japan's open radio access network for secure communications, those uh, combined systems to provide essentially secure systems and America's ability to um, uh, to launch a satellite, a Philippine satellite this summer uh, on a SpaceX. Uh, all of those speak to trying to build secure, trusted communications comprehensively for the Philippines 
in preparation for future disasters, including presumably a crisis in the West Philippine Sea. You mentioned there were 70 um, agreements just from the bilateral. Um, wh which of these defense agreements uh, particularly stood out for you? Well, bilaterally with Japan, the most uh, important uh, element of the military relationship is the commitment to build uh, a command and control architecture that allows for Japanese and U.S. military forces to be interoperable in a crisis. The U.S. forces in Japan will be operating directly in the theater with the Japanese self-defense forces um, and able to make uh, decisions, uh, presumably in the coming months and years, um, on the ground, rather than having to relay them back to the Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii or back to Washington or coordination between Tokyo and Washington. So for China, what do you think they would be the most concerned about? Some Chinese commentators have already talked about their concern, their concern of a strategic triangle uh, formulating uh, in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and around the Taiwan Strait. Um, so the ability of the United States to operationalize that lattice work of security frameworks and alliances into something that would obstruct China's ability to forcefully unify Taiwan if that decision were made uh, in Beijing. That was the Hudson Institute's Patrick Croning speaking with me earlier. In the first state visit by a Japanese leader in nine years, the two nations announced a new era of strategic cooperation. Homiya Kishida addressed U.S. Congress in English with this message. China's current external stance and military actions present unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge, not only to the peace and security of Japan, but to the peace and stability of international community at large. Dr. Chen, so we heard yes. that China represents the greatest of challenges, of strategic challenges. What do you think um, is the most significant announcement out of those 70 defense agreements yeah. for Taiwan? Yeah, well, I think, um, I don't remember either Fang Yu or Bing Kui already mentioned that each of them is you know, a big deal. Mm, yes. Yeah to not only Taiwan, but also, well, not only Japan and the US, but also Taiwan. Mm. So everyone is definitely very important to Taiwan. Mm. I think overall, that means that the US already, you know, put into practice to increase, you know, its influence and its, you know, preparation for any kind of, you know, uh, potential Taiwan contingency in East Asia. And I think, you know, Tokyo and the Washington, they already, you know, kind of uh, prepare for that kind of, you know, situation. Bing Kui, let's um, talk about one specific uh, announcement that came out. So US, Japan and Australia are to establish a, um, an air missile defense Defenses. architecture. Yeah. So what details do we know about this? And again, how significant is this for Taiwan itself? Okay. Uh, the, the thing is, um, w the U.S. has already had the missile defense system but in Asia, but usually in Northeast Asia. So in the past, uh, we know that uh, the U.S. deployed radar system and missile defense system in K South Korea and Japan. Mm. But this is, I think this is the first time that the U.S. is trying to uh, create a overall East Asia missile defense system which coordinates different allies. So the involvement of, mm. of Australia is significant. Now think about why Australia needs a missile defense system. Mm. Because it may have incoming missiles, right? So it means that Australia already, already recognized that there is a possibility that when, uh, when the US is involved in certain conflict, that the Australia will be the target. So it needs some defense system. Mm. And Australia agrees that the U.S. presence in Australia is paramount and is very important to its own security. So that's, that's why this is significant. We have seen a, uh, a chain of, of alignment in East Asia and maybe including the Indo-Pacific, including the in Indian Ocean too. This, mm. is, this is why a missile system in South Pacific would be quite important. Mm. And I also understand there's also the, the information sharing mm. that will become like you're talking about multi, multinational, multi-party. Right. In information sharing mechanism has already been there. Uh, they, they continue to strengthen it. Mm. Okay. Fang Yu, so, uh, you know, the, the missiles um, that were launched over Taiwan after 
Nancy Pelosi, the, the former U.S. House of Representatives speaker, came to Taiwan. Um, they didn't just land, you know, uh, around Taiwan. They also landed in Japan's EEZ. I think China is testing how the Japan is reacting to to this. So China mm -hmm. just deliberately firing a missile into Japan's EEZ, mm -hmm. and Japan did. Uh, have a signal sending back to China that they are trying <laughs> to upgrade the whole defense system and also make an alliance with the U.S. and the neighboring countries. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, and also I think that time when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, China uh, blocked uh, the whole Taiwan uh, Strait, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the U.S. now strengthening the defense system uh, in the northeast of Taiwan, that is uh, toward the, the whole uh, the Okinawa uh, base there. So they, w they want to make sure that there will be no blockade uh, during a potential conflict. So I think, yeah, the, the U.S. trying to respond and the, the, w with the alliance. Mm. And Japan, obviously very vulnerable given the proximity. Dr. Chen, um, there will also be joint military exercises. I mean, in fact, we saw, you know, the, the quadrilateral Navy exercise on the Sunday before the summits. Mm -hmm. That was between <clears throat> Japan, the U.S., um, Japan, U, uh, the US, US, Philippines, and Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah, and um, Jake Sullivan um, is <clears throat> on record as saying to expect to see more of this. Um, as part of these summits, there was announced uh, joint military exercise between Japan, the US, and the UK. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you make of these, what some people are calling mini-laterals? Mm -hmm. Well, well, definitely, I think you can see the U.S. over the uh, past years uh, tries to build up kind of, you know, uh, I would say semi-NATO uh, security framework in East Asia. So, well, like what I say, we, we do see, you know, the U.S. You know, put it into practice. Mm. Yeah, so you can see so many, you know, bilateral, uh, trilateral, and multilateral, mm. you know, military drills mm. in the uh, regions. But and, NATO and is founded on the Article Five, which is a strike on one is a strike on all of us. I exactly, exactly. But well, I say semi NATO right. kind mm -hmm. of security framework in Asia. So absolutely, I think it's still not a, you know uh, hundred percent like you know NATO uh, in Asia but it's moving toward kind of, you know, multilateral uh, security framework. But you, you, you might see, you know, all the members of these, you know, uh, partners, they, they are, you know, US allies, mm -hmm. yeah, no matter in Europe or in Asia. So you might, you know, put, you know, the US Washington in the center mm -hmm. and you can see, you know, hub and spoke, mm -hmm. you still can see it's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, radiation of the security framework. Mm. So I say it's kind of semi-NATO security framework. Mm. Still, attack one, it might be attack all, mm. all of the United States allies. But because of the mutual defense treaties with the US, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Bing Kui, uh, you know, we've long heard of this lattice work mm. of alliances that Biden administration is seeking to build. So are we now starting to see how they can be operationalized? Uh, I actually wrote about this a couple of years ago. I, I argue that uh, we, we will still see a hub and spoke system, but the U.S. will start to link those different uh, allies and partners. And this will be more effective than a multilateral alliance because the U.S. can better control each alliance and each uh, each alliance relationship and how their partners interact. Mm. So. So you're saying that they won't be spoke to spoke? Uh, they will be. They will be. They are actually. Uh, they they are more and more uh, activities, cooperation between spoke and spoke. And you can see that the U.S. is trying to uh, cont contribute to that. Mm. And the U.S. the U.S. actually sit in the middle and control those those cooperation. And those cooperation actually benefits the U.S. strategic interest. So. I would, I would say the U.S. will continue to use this method to manage its alliances and par partners in East Asia and in, even in the Pacific. Okay. Fang Yu, final question. What do you predict is Beijing's next move, either in South China Sea, Taiwan Strait, or East China Sea? Well, we see that the Beijing is bullying the Philippines. <laughs> they're, trying to, <laughs> they're trying to send more vessels, especially military vessels. So in this march, which is the first time, that the military missiles, uh, military warships there. 
So, uh, so yeah, they, they will bully the Philippines and also they will try to, I mean, uh, because they will have, uh, Taiwan has a new government coming, right? So they are trying to maybe do some uh, gray zone activities to test how Taiwan will react to Beijing. Mm. So, so you, you think it will just be more of the same? Is this, maybe I should ask uh, Dr. Chen, just more of the same that, that, that China to do. What can it do other than more of the same? Well, like Fang Yu say, I agree with that. Yeah, China might conduct more, you know, gray zone operation activities in East, uh, South China Seas and the, the Taiwan Strait. Mm. So I think that's quite, you know, predictable. Yeah, mm. in the coming uh, weeks. Right. Bing yeah. um, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel blocked two Philippine survey ships yeah. for around eight hours. We understand this was just 35 nautical miles from the Philippines coastline. Um, do you see this as, as their form of escalation? Uh, I wouldn't say it's an escalation, but that's a, certainly a practice that China tried to, uh, try to do and try to show the Philippines that uh, you better not do something that we don't want. Mm. But as you can see, Philippines is unyielding and Philippines got the external help. So I would say, um, I would say this is actually counter-effective. Mm. Okay, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much, Evans Chen, and Tsung Bing Gui, and Tsung Fang Yu for joining Taiwan Talks today. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching the show today. Stay safe, and see you next time.